Hello there everybody and welcome to the first meta analysis for Wastelands Tournament Season 2. Anthony joining you once again and the last time we were here we were talking about what the OI's results meant for the meta going forward and now that Wave 8 is in the fold the meta has been thrown into disarray and it's time for me to throw out predictions that will prove to be stupid in about a month. With that let's get started. First order of business, let's actually go back to talking about the top three of the OI for a second because those are probably the decks everyone's going to be thinking about going into E1. As a reminder, the top three were Galaxy Prime in first, Metroplex in second, and Devastator in third. And going into E1, I do think all of them are going to crack into the top cut assuming people are playing them. For Metroplex, he actually wasn't a consideration for a while due to a reason I'll dive into later, but now he seems to be an option again, and he does get some new tools in Wave 8 in the city's finest views and an exorable force that could very well propel him to success. That being said, he's still an incredibly difficult deck to pilot, so unless someone's been practicing with him behind the scenes and I'm not aware of it, I'm really only expecting one Metroplex to show up, if at all. As for Galaxy Prime, as discussed last time, it's been massively improved compared to the versions that were around after the EI, making it much more of a threat overall, and it also gets several new tools out of Wave 8, primarily Auxiliary Fuel Tank as a replacement for Energy Pack since it's less of a brick and it can be put on anyone, and Patrol the Perimeter could either supplement or replace Hidden Fort if you want additional black icons. However, there are a couple of factors that have me hesitant to say that Galaxy Prime could win this event, First is the introduction of a press. While Metro gains a counter in an exorable force, Galaxy Prime does not, and even a couple extra points of damage here and there can be problematic for blue decks, even one that has a ton of health like Galaxy Prime does. Additionally, between the two sub-archetypes within the Junkion faction, the more playable of the two is looking to be Bandit, which has an in-archetype belligerence and decelerator laser, so if that proves to be a top contender in this event, that could also spell problems for Galaxy Prime. Finally, we come to one of my pet decks in Devastator, who technically can also use Auxiliary and Inexorable, but I'm not too sure about either of those, since Devi really only cares about health after the combine, if you're combining at all, making Auxiliary a bit more of a brick than usual, and Inexorable may not do that much, since he does tend to care about raw attack values rather than bold. However, he does have one new tool in his arsenal that could help in the event your opponent is packing cornered. Nucleon Exposure. Not only does it stop your opponent's cornered, but it also accelerates your combine while giving you an extra card for your next turn. If people are expecting Devastator, which they likely are given his two top four finishes in the OI, they're likely to be packing cornered in the side, which means if you're planning to play Devi, Nucleon should, at minimum, be in your sideboard as a two of. One quick side note, put a stinger in the works is now a thing, but that's likely to fall to the wayside at the moment due to the familiarity of the malevolent version of the deck with the player base, but given some harmony results, despite the card being different then, I do think there is potential for that version of the deck. Moving along, there is actually one other change Devi has gone through, and that is the banning and replacing of Fusion Borer with Mechastar, and Mechastar does deserve a bit of discussion. The intent behind this replacement was to A, increase deck building decisions, and B, increase player decision points when Mechastar and another weapon are available to play in-game. From what I've seen in the offseason, the first point of that hasn't been seen a whole lot. Basically, every deck I build still has three Mechastar, but others may not be as high on the card as I am. But what I have definitely noticed changing is the in-game decision part of things. I've had plenty of moments where I've contemplated if Mechastar was the right move compared to something like a Grenade Launcher or a Laser Cutlass, whereas when Mechastar was Fusion Borer, Fusion Borer was the correct play almost every time. I feel like we're going to see a continuation of that going into E1, where a lot of decks are playing Mechastar, but it actually sees the field at a much lower rate compared to Fusion Borer, and if that proves to be the case, Mechastar will have done its job. Speaking of bands, there were four other bands in the offseason. Quake, Fangry, Horrible, and Sky Shadow Sync. The former happened in the middle of the season, while the latter three happened a couple weeks ago after a one-day event that Zero hosted. And all these bands are significant. We've seen that when these assholes are in the format, the top cut usually features several copies of them, but when they were banned in Garrus 9 at various points during the season, diversity in the top cut and the event overall shot up exponentially, and their power level is directly tied to that. 
having these guys gone vastly increases the amount of options available to players simply because they don't have to worry about if their decisions are optimal enough to beat these Wave 5 powerhouses. As an example of this, when the preliminary ban lists were announced for E1 and Sync wasn't on Garrus 9, Ozzy said something that either heavily implied or flat out said, I can't remember exactly, that Metroplex wasn't a consideration if Sky Shadow was legal. With that out of the picture, there's a chance we see Metro running around at all, and I know many other players probably have similar options that just opened up to them because of that. As for if anything steps in to replace them, there really aren't any other cards that do what Quake, Sky Shadow, and Bull do, but Barrage is likely to fill the void left by Fangry, as he has a similar presence in terms of his abilities, but his bolt is a bit more conditional, even if that condition is laughably easy to achieve still. But enough about the past, let's look at Wave 8 itself and talk about what out of it we might be seeing this event. If you remember the Season 1 post-E1 analysis, I mentioned the ooh shiny new stuff effect being present in that event, where everyone was playing stuff out of Wave 6 because it was new, instead of the then unbanned degeneracy of Wave 5. I feel like we're going to see something similar this time around, but it'll be less because everyone's tired of the same three decks, and more because people are going to be throwing whatever at the wall to get a feel for the meta. We're likely to see several of the OI decks floating around as well, but out of Wave 8, here's a list of what I think is likely to pop up. Bandit Bikes, Soundwave, Sharks, Gators, and Thunderguts. Admittedly, most of these are orange decks, but based on what we've seen in testing, these decks have the most available knowledge on how they function, and as a result, people are likely going to gravitate towards them. Soundwave is the most straightforward of the bunch, as Ozzy's shown his power back in Season 1, but what he has going for him with the release of Wave 8 is Wing Thing, who, as I said in the 9 words or less video, pairs perfectly with what Soundwave's trying to do, and gives him a direct damage outlet that can either work with Soundwave Superior if you're playing more of a control strategy, or work on its own in an aggro build. For Bandit Bikes, the Bandit Junkions have shown themselves to be the more consistent of the two sub-archetypes within the faction, and the tools they have available are insane. Not only do they get a mini belligerence and decelerator laser, but they get one of the most conditionally powerful defensive tools in the game in Dare to be Stupid, and they have an insane post-combat trick in Everything Must Go. On top of that, Motorcycles already have two great aggro support pieces in Bike Gang and Papa Wheelie, and their survivability per character is a bit better than something like Devastator, so they have a good chance to crack into the meta, and I wouldn't be surprised if a few show up in the event. The only thing I could see preventing this from appearing is that station mechanics are a bit complex, and that might scare some people off. Moving on, Sharks are a deck we've seen before, but now it gains two new options for its boss character, as I'm dubbing it. Previously, they had Deliberata, but now they have Muck Sergeant Peck, which makes each shark more of a full character, has an insane rolling action support effect, can help with damage control, and enables multi-plays of Sharktacon Matrix, and Sharkatron, who offers extra card plays and extra attack to sharks and or gators, while also having some revives that can affect sharks or gators in the form of Writhing in the Deep. You'll notice I mentioned gators in both of those, and previously they could be used with the Liberata, but it wasn't as good as sharks since Pit only revives sharks. Now they can use Peck to help keep damage off of them while also setting up rolling action plays so you can play defensive cards on your turn, or Gators could use Sharkatron, which gives extra plays and gives them a revive option. Additionally, Bolag is easily the best of the three Gators given his bot mode, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some primarily Gator decks running around, or even a mix of Sharks and Gators in the same deck with Peck. Of course, Sharks Pure are still in a really good position, as both Peck and Sharkatron may reduce the skill floor needed to pilot them, leading to more Shark decks being played, as the Deliberata version of the deck is a very complex beast to pilot. Finally, we have Thunderguts. I don't think this deck is in a position to compete for a top spot just yet, due to a lack of experience with the deck, since it was released fairly late into the beta but I do think the potential is there due to the fact that we're in a heavy aggro meta, and Stockpile punishes aggro characters hard with his bot mode. Additionally, Thunderguts, on combined, has the most insane heal effect in the game, or one of the most insane, I mean, let's be real, Sludge is still slightly more insane, even if it is just healing from a 5-star, and the amount of damage that Thunderguts can throw out makes him, in my eyes, a more balanced version of Sky Shadow. The only problem with the deck is that it heavily relies 
relies on giving your opponent Drifter, and while Spread Democracy and Hodgepodge exist, Spread requires a turn of setup while Hodgepodge is an armor, so Bashing Shield is always a threat. However, if those issues can be resolved, I wouldn't be surprised if Thunderguts shows up. And that's really everything I wanted to talk about. The format post-offseason bans is in a great place, and as we discussed, a whole swath of decks are available to use and likely succeed with. It's just a matter if people are versed enough in these new decks to take them all away, and we'll find out starting on August 16th. Of course, I'll be streaming a match from each round and as many top cut matches as possible, but as previously mentioned, or maybe you're hearing this for the first time, those will be streamed over on our new Twitch page instead of the live channel, and I'll link to that in the description. With that being said, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard here today. If you did, there's a little red button you can push down below to show that. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what happens in E1. Again, there's a lot of stuff that could be interesting, a lot of interesting strategies available. Should be good to watch. And with that being said, that will do it for this video. Don't forget to play your rolling action hate. Peace out, y'all.